Hello, everybody. My name is Tom Singari. Uh, I am proud to be one of the directors for the Kabuki Syndrome Foundation. And um, I'm also the proud dad of uh, little Sammy, who is my son, who is turning two years old in about a week and a half. Uh, he was diagnosed with Kabuki Syndrome at just three weeks of age. And I am proud to present here to all of you. Um, I'd like to take a moment to discuss the Kabuki Syndrome Foundation's funding model in more detail. Um, but first, how much does research cost? These are some examples of how uh, much does research cost. So a smaller targeted grant at one institution can cost anywhere from $30,000 to $50,000 per year for a minimum of two years. And then funding a postdoc salary at an, at an institution could cost anywhere from $55,000 to $68,000 per year for a minimum of two years. Um, Cross-institutional collaboration to fund postdoc salaries, travel, and other resources at three key centers of excellence can cost anywhere from $165,000 to $250,000 per year for a minimum of three years. Um, some of the collaboration enabling tools that Kabuki Syndrome Foundation has been involved in. Um, one of them is a virtual bio repository that will be shared by four institutions. And this comes at a cost of $120,000 per year for a minimum of two years. And then also um, shared reagents can cost anywhere from $50,000 to $100,000. And this is just giving you some of the, you know, some of the costs and why we're raising money and what all of this money can do and where it's going to go. Um, so we've seen the slide earlier in the presentation, but these are our key foundation strategies. And so um, we have a set goal of raising $5 million over the next three years and which will continue to fuel our work across three general initiatives. One is strategic investment in the centers of excellence, which will enable and, accel and accelerate Kabuki syndrome research and, con and contribute to targeted research programs. Um, strategic investment into centers of excellence would provide investment in centers of excellence like Boston Children's Hospital and Johns Hopkins and Kennedy Krieger Institute and are leading the way in that are leading the way in Kabuki syndrome research via improved diagnosis, early intervention, and symptom management, supporting Kabuki syndrome patients worldwide with multidisciplinary teams. Um, enabling and accelerating Kabuki syndrome research. Uh, this is to build strategic partnerships that will pool resources and accelerate research efforts. Enable collaboration via critical research tools and support clinical trial readiness within the patient community. And lastly is contribute to target research programs. And this addresses funding, funding gaps for the most promising research projects, creating awareness among the incent and incent new research to pursue Kabuki syndrome research. Um, identify new paths of research that will further expand treatment possibilities and to award grants for priority research initiatives. Please help us research our funding goals by making a donation using the donate button located above the agenda in the menu on the left. And with that, I would like to introduce our speakers for this session. Um, as we look at the research landscape, it is important to understand what model systems are being used that could potentially advance the treatments for genetic diseases like Kabuki syndrome. In this segment, you will learn about various in vivo and in vitro models used to study Kabuki syndrome and the benefits of using various model systems in rare disease research. Um, first, I would like to introduce Dr. Max Hyman from Boston Children's Hospital. He is going to talk about Fast, Cheap, and Powerful, a whole animal model of Kabuki syndrome in C. elegans. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Tom. Happy early birthday to Sammy. And thank you. I want to start out by introducing myself. I'm Max Heyman from the Roya Kabuki Center at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And I also want to start out by thanking Janet Lee and everyone who's helped to put this together. Your incredibly hard work on this is really inspiring. And what you've created here in this conference is incredibly valuable to myself and I think to the entire community. And what I'd like to do today is to tell you about the fast, cheap, and powerful whole animal model of Kabuki syndrome that we've been developing. 
And I wanna start out just by stepping back and saying that whenever we think about genetic conditions, there's this problem that you need to understand them at the size scales that span across billions. Uh, so we know that genetic conditions start with a change in the DNA and end up with a difference in the individual. But there's so many steps in between that. As has been talked about already, the DNA can be thought of like a sheet of text with instructions being read out. And that leads to the production of proteins, which are tools. They're things like hammers and bolts and scissors and glue that actually help to build structures. And what they're building are these cells that are several thousands of times bigger than the proteins themselves. So this is a huge leap. So for example, if a protein is the size of a hammer, a cell would be the size of a city. And then it gets even worse. These cells, hundreds of thousands of cells, assemble into structures like tissues, all different cell types coordinating together, nerve cells, muscle cells, to form these tissues that are several thousand times bigger than an individual cell. So now if we're thinking of a cell as the size of a city, these tissues would be the size of a country with hundreds of thousands of cities inside it. And then we start to run out of things to compare it to as these tissues assemble into an organism that's again, a thousand fold bigger in size. This would be like hundreds and thousands of countries assembling into multiple Earths. Okay, so we're trying to understand everything from the smallest scale proteins all the way up to something that's on the scale of multiple Earths. This is an incredibly challenging problem in understanding how genetic conditions manifest themselves. And the solution that we at the Kabuki Center of Children's use and that we as a community use is that different people work in different experimental systems that focus on different size scales. And then by collaborating and communicating very closely together, we integrate what we've learned at each size scale to try to get a complete picture. And so I've been asked to try to introduce some concepts in what we mean by in vitro and in vivo systems. And I'll do that on the next couple of slides. In vitro systems are cells in a dish. These focus on single cells and how individual proteins can build single cells. It's not actually in glass, as the name suggests. We grow these cells in little plastic dishes like this. And in this case, the cells have been taken out of the very complex, messy, chaotic environment of the animal and are grown in this artificial, highly controlled system where we can study in an individual kind of cell how a given protein helps to build it. This would be like trying to understand what the role of cars is in Boston, right? How cars work in Boston. And if you can understand that, you can have a pretty good idea for how cars work in Detroit or San Francisco. Although if you've driven in Boston, you know that's not a perfect analogy. I also want to mention another in vitro system that's very exciting that you've been hearing about, which are these organoids, where instead of having just one kind of cell in the dish, you're mixing multiple cell types together, nerve cells and muscle cells, again, taking them out of that chaotic, messy environment of the animal and focusing on them in this controlled artificial environment and allowing multiple cell types to interact where you start to recapitulate some of the complexity that you would have in a living animal. Again, this is still an in vitro system, but it begins to expand, expand the scope of what we can study in in vitro systems from single proteins and single cells to complex multicellular structures. Okay, I hope that's okay. At the other end of the spectrum is what I'm gonna call in vivo systems. These are whole animal systems where you focus on an intact living animal as it develops, gets born, grows, reproduces, ages, dies, all things that are very hard to capture using a cell in a dish type of approach. In these systems, we tend to focus on the larger scale of size, on the entire organism or on entire tissues. Although the cells and proteins are still there and we can also study them. It's just when you're working with that level of complexity, you tend to focus on the bigger things. And of course, you're familiar with studies, clinical studies in humans and laboratory studies in whole mice and you've been hearing about in zebrafish, another very powerful system. And then I want to introduce another system that we've been using that has the advantage of letting us span easily across all these size scales. This is a kind of an animal system called Cenorhabditis elegans or C. elegans for short. This is a picture of one of these little worms. This is its head. This is its tail over here. Here are a couple of embryos that are in the process of developing. This whole animal is just a millimeter long. We grow them on these little dishes. There's probably a thousand animals on this little dish. So they're very tiny. If you're a gardener, you're familiar with these nematodes that grow in the soil. 
in the wild. They're very good for your garden. You want to have them there. They're a sign of healthy soil. Sometimes you buy them and deposit them in the soil. You can also grow them in the lab where they're a very powerful system, partly for this reason that they're so small and they have very few cells, but the cells they have are very much like our own. So like us, these little worms have nerve cells, they have muscle cells, they have skin cells, they have organs, they have an intestine, they have a kidney, but the whole kidney is just three cells big, right? So it's a very scaled down miniature animal that allows us to easily jump between questions at the level of proteins and cells to multi-cells, multi-cell types interacting with each other to the entire animal very quickly. That's one set of advantages. The other advantage I wanna highlight is that they're very fast and cheap to work with. And I'll just spend one slide talking about this. This is just a sort of rough estimate I'm making of what a typical timeline of an experiment might be in different systems. So in this y-axis, I'm showing how many weeks an experiment might take. In C. elegans, a typical experiment would be one or two weeks long. In most other systems, a typical experiment might last from two to 10 weeks. They're also very cheap, excluding the cost of those postdoc or other PhD level scientist salaries, which are always the bulk of the expenses, just the materials. For doing an experiment, just looking at that, uh, C. elegans experiment uh, can typically be done, not an experiment, an entire study, meaning from the first experiment all the way to the published manuscript, the paper and the literature, an entire study might cost a few thousand dollars, where in other systems, a complete study might cost anywhere from a few thousand to a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so this is a very powerful system. We have these tiny animals, we can study cells, tissues, or the entire animal, and we can work with them very quickly and cheaply. They've never been used to study Kabuki syndrome. My lab uses C. elegans to study- Dr. Hyman, can you Yes, me? yes, I hey, can. Uh, you're, yeah, there you go. Your mic was just rubbing against your shirt. So oh, I'm a, so sorry. Perfect, that actually- I'm makes so sorry, much, thank much you for better. letting me know. No worries, thank you. I'll hold it up. So my lab uses C. elegans to study the development of the nervous system. It had never been used to study Kabuki syndrome. And we were approached asking, would it be possible to use C. elegans to better understand Kabuki syndrome? And so I'll tell you about our progress uh, very recently in this area. And first, just as I, what I think will be a refresher based on what's already been discussed, Kabuki syndrome is caused by reduced but not eliminated levels, reduced levels of either of two proteins, KMT2D or KDM6A. And the question we wanted to ask is what happens at the cell, tissue, and animal level as KMT2D or KDM6A levels are reduced? And the advantages we can uh, leverage in C. elegans are some of these really powerful genetic tools. So one of the most important things is that although it's a tiny worm, most of its genes are the same as ours. So it has a tiny worm version of KMT2D that makes a KMT2D protein, worm version of this protein that's very similar to the human version and carries out all the same functions. Same for KDM6A. Second, its genome is small. It's about a 10th the size of the human genome and it's easy to manipulate. So one of the first things we did in starting this project was to modify worms to modify the KMT2D gene in worms, adding two features to it. One is this GFP or green fluorescent protein that I'm drawing as this green arrow. This is just what it sounds like. It's, it, it makes this protein turn glow green under a fluorescent lamp. Uh, this is incredibly powerful. You can look at a live animal as it's moving around and you can literally see the protein in this living animal. This is a technique that was actually pioneered in C. elegans and the scientists who did that first in the mid nineties received a Nobel prize for that work. It's been used in all kinds of systems and we still use it very extensively in the worm. So one of the first things we did was make a KMT2D that we could see in live animals by tagging it with this green fluorescent protein. And we also added a second tag that I'll tell you about next called this AID or auxin degron tag. And I'll just simplify this saying it's a part of this very powerful genetic toolbox that we have available in the system. This auxin degron allows the precise removal of a given protein in any cell. Uh, so I'm drawing it as this little notch that we've added to the KMT2D protein. And we can add a drug called auxin that I'm drawing as this black diamond. And in the presence of that drug, the tagged KMT2D protein will be very efficiently removed. This is usually used to completely remove levels down to zero, but we thought maybe we could use this 
to just moderately reduce levels similar to what's observed in Kabuki syndrome and create a C. elegans model of that reduced KMT2D observed in Kabuki syndrome. So this was our strategy, was to use this auxin diagram system to modify the KMT2D gene that would allow us to arbitrarily reduce KMT2D levels or KDM6A levels to any intermediate level, any intermediate amount of reduction. And then we could ask, using this powerful C. elegans system, what happens to cells, tissues, or the entire animal? Okay, so here's some pictures of what we actually saw. So these are pictures of the tails of worms that we've introduced as our Kabuki model. Here, green is that green fluorescent KMT2D protein. So here you're seeing a live animal that's just been picked up and put on a slide and we took a picture of it. Here's its tail. Each of these circles is a single cell expressing KMT2D protein. And what you're seeing is the protein in that cell. This is when we don't add any of that auxin. As we start adding increasing doses of that auxin drug, you can see we're reducing the levels of KMT2D to intermediate levels and then eventually gone completely. We can quantify these changes. Here on the y-axis of this graph, I'm showing the intensity of these green fluorescents, how much KMT2D there is across three independent replicate experiments, and then showing the average. And what we find is that starting out at a baseline of 100% levels of KMT2D, we can reduce it down to 74%, down to 24%, down to almost gone. But these intermediate levels being the most interesting, being the best mimic we can do for what's happening in Kabuki syndrome with those intermediate levels of KMT2D protein. And so then we asked, what happens at the cellular level, at the organismal level, as KMT2D levels are reduced? And we did that a number of ways. The one I'll tell you about is by looking at the expression level of all other genes. And we asked, are there other genes whose expression changes as we reduce KMT2D levels? And in fact, there are. We found 1,410 genes whose expression was really highly correlated with the levels of KMT2D. So here's one of those genes as an example. This is a gene that's never been studied before. Its function is unknown. It just has this technical name. But it's interesting because as we add more auxin and as we reduce KMT2D levels, perfectly in sync with that, we see a depletion of the expression of this gene. So it's something that goes down as KMT2D goes down. We also found genes that do the opposite. We found an equal number of genes that instead of going down, go up. So here, as we're reducing KMT2D levels, genes that were not expressed at all suddenly turn on blazingly highly expressed. So this is giving us our first insight in this simple model to what are the cellular and organismal changes molecularly to reducing KMT2D levels. So that's telling us about the biology. It's also giving us a really valuable set of tools because now we can use these to find drugs that might ameliorate these effects. And we've begun doing this again because it's such a fast system. Just very recently, we've begun to already perform preliminary screens for these kinds of drugs, and we're already getting our first hits. This is not using that gene expression as a readout. This is using a different readout of reduced KMT2 levels, different readout of the organismal response, but we see some altered development of the animals. When KMT2D is maintained at its full level, we never see this altered development. But when we reduce its levels, we see about three quarters of the animals show this, re so show this altered development. And in a small candidate screen, we've already identified a drug that reduces significantly the fraction of animals that show that altered development down from three quarters to about 40%. So a really significant amelioration of the changes caused by reduced KMT2 levels. And this is just a first pass because these animals are so small and easy to grow, we can now embark on these very systematic large scale screens to identify drugs that are even more effective in ameliorating the effects of reduced KMT2D or KDM6A. So just to summarize, what I've shown you is we've developed this fast, cheap, powerful system to let us identify the effects of reduced KMT2D and to begin to find drugs that can ameliorate those effects using this modified KMT2D and the C. elegans system to systematically reduce KMT2D levels, to use gene expression profiling and other methods to identify the cellular and organismal effects of those changes, and then to use this powerful system for these large-scale drug screens to identify drugs that can ameliorate these effects. So all this work was done at the Roya Kabuki Center at Austin Children's Hospital with generous support from the Xenia family. It's being led by Carolina Mizraka in my lab and was jump-started by Nate Ortiz. We received a lot of support and guidance and our clinical connections from Olaf Bodemer, who's the director of the Kabuki Center, and our collaborators on the bioinformatics side have given us support, Alice Lee, 
and Jason Choi. And thank you so much for listening. I'd be glad to take questions after this session or to hear from you uh, separately offline. Thanks very much. <laughs>